on your screen now, we have provided a fun and engaging poll for you to fill out. And we will begin our programming promptly at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. So please sit tight. Morning visitors, on your screen right now, we have provided a fun and engaging poll for you to fill out. Uh, we will begin our programming promptly at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, so uh, we will be getting started here shortly. Thank you. I'd be starting anew. I wish I could be like a bird in the sky. How sweet it would be the time that I could fly. I'd soar to the sun and look down at the sea. Then I'd sing, cause I know how it feels to be free. Then I'd sing, cause I know. To be free. I wish I could share all the love that's in my heart. I wish I could break all the things that bind us apart. Wish you could know what it means to be me. You'd see, you'd agree, everybody should be free, because if we ain't the murderers, I could be like a bird in the sky. How sweet it would be. Good morning, guests. On your screen right now, we've provided a fun and engaging poll for you to fill out. Please do so, and uh, we will begin our programming shortly. We'll give everyone a little bit of time in order to register, so we'll start in about three minutes. So hang tight. It'll get really, really engaging here in just a moment. Sure it, but I'm still free. 
Morning guests, if you are just now joining us, we do have a poll that we'd like you to fill out. It's a fun and engaging poll that you can uh, participate in right now. We're going to get started here in just a moment, um, and we welcome you. We will be closing the poll down at the end of the song, so please go ahead and participate. This will be our last song before the poll is over.
Good morning, members and friends. My name is Heather Williams, and I am the program director of the San Antonio African American Community Archives and Museum. I am so happy to be here with you all this morning. Uh, I would like to welcome each and every one of you to our third installment of our members only virtual discussion. We're so very glad you could join us this morning and I want to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way first. Um, please present any questions you might have during this discussion over in the chat room and we'll present those questions to the panelists as soon as we can. This morning's discussion is entitled, The Power of Your Story. And boy, do we have a dynamic panel for you this morning, so it's gonna be really exciting. Uh, I would like though, first of all, to thank the Carver Community Center, our SACAM board, our SACAM committee members, our SACAM friends and volunteers, because we would not be able to do this without their assistance and guidance. Now, um, I would like to tell you a little bit about our event facilitator, who is the executive director of SACAM, Ms. Deborah Omawale Jarman. Ms. Jarman is a powerhouse of knowledge and experience and is extremely instrumental in fulfilling the mission of SACAM, which is to collect, preserve, and share the cultural heritage of African Americans in the San Antonio region. While not a native San Antonian, Ms. Jarman has been here for several years and is thoroughly involved in all things pertaining to the cultural history of San Antonio. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to some and present to others, Ms. Deborah Omawale Jarman. Hi everyone, how are you? And I don't know, can you see me? Can, um, hello? That's a yes, okay, cool. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm learning how to work this, so thank you for your patience. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be here today. And some people may be thinking, well, I'm not quite sure why uh, uh, oral history is so important. Well, at SACAM, we are a community archive and museum. So your stories, the oral history, is what makes our archive rich. We also, though, want to get our um, artifacts, so we're scanning church programs and dance programs and report cards and all of that so we can build a rich collection of the history of African Americans in San Antonio. Um, I've only been on the job for four months and my esteemed colleague that is partnering with me on this call has been on, her, on the job for about 12 years. Well, I have to say my second day on the job, I had the privilege to meet with her. And I said, okay, Cassandra, this is what we're going to do. What do you think? And so you may really be wondering, what does the Carver Community Cultural Center have to do with oral histories? So Cassandra, why don't you give everyone a sense of the Carver's uh, involvement in oral history, please. And tell them about yourself too. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good morning. I like Deborah, can everyone see me? <laughs> um, I'm also figuring this out. So uh, Deborah, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today and for asking the Carver to partner uh, with SACAM in this wonderful event. Um, you know, I feel that the Carver's history is like intricately tied with oral history, right? So for us, um, we see ourselves as an institution, also as a collector of stories and as a teller of stories. Um, and when we think about just the history of the Carver, but also the history of, of all communities, especially communities and people of color, oral history plays a critical role um, Oftentimes, that is the way, um, the only way that we know what, you know what has gone before. And we can't know who we are today or where we're moving towards if we don't know where we've come from. So for us, you know, oral history is significantly important. Um, 
and again, not just as kind of a people, but also as, as the institution, the Carver itself. I mean, our history is so tied to the Black community in San Antonio, and much of what we know about the history of the Carver has come from kind of this oral tradition. So much of it is, is what has been gifted to us um, from members of the community who share their stories and their experiences um, and their connections to the Carver. But I think that's true, you know, I think that's true across everything. Um, you know, I often think about how um, as a child, like listening to my, my grandmother or my grandfather um, tell me stories about their lives and that that is, is so much a part of my kind of root of self, like where I'm from. So um, it's very important to the Carver. We're very interested in it, not only for our own history, but also in our mission to, you know, to give voice to communities and individuals that haven't often had a, a platform or a place to share their stories. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, speaking of stories, this morning we are delighted and honored to have a storyteller and a theatrical artist to, among, among some, other things to be able to share with us. So I am going to speak with you about uh, Daiquiri Brooks. And just let me get this screen going again. Uh, thank you all for your patience as we work through this. Okay. Ms. Daiquiri began her career in New York City as a senior media relations executive with more than 20 years of communications expertise, she specializes in dynamic and memorable storylines to help companies increase brand visibility and market share. She has secured countless business articles for her clients in publications such as the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, and Time Magazine. One of her career highlights was securing a cover for her client in Forbes Magazine. Writer, speaker, trainer, and coach, Dacri has a passion for building authentic relationships and teaching women how to overcome negative self-talk. She has a bachelor's degree in mass communications from Mary Baldwin University in Staunton, Virginia. Dacri is the first person in her family to graduate from college and break the cycle of generational poverty. She believes adversity builds character and loves to quote her favorite poet, Maya Angelou. Her mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. Dacri, cur Dacri currently resides in San Antonio, Texas, and in her spare time, which Wow, I can't believe she has any. She enjoys writing, teaching Zumba fitness classes, and traveling around the world with her family. Welcome, Daiquiri. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the great introduction. Um, I am really excited and honored to be on this uh, call with all of you this Saturday morning. And it's funny because, um, you know, I remember similar to Cassandra, my grandma sharing stories with me. And as I'm talking, I'm looking and totally um, captivated by Joe's shirt. My ancestors are proud because, you know, um, storytelling is, is part of our ancestral heritage and bonds. And we are ancestors and we are to be ancestors. And so it's very important through sharing our stories that we continue to pass on that legacy of storytelling. Awesome, oh. Th thank you. Yeah. No, you're, you're good. I'm gonna, bring, oh. I'm gonna bring it back up and we're gonna talk about Jill. Hold on one second, Cassandra. There we go. Fantastic. So it's my um, it's my honor and privilege to introduce um, our other speaker this morning, Joe Talbert Jr. Um, 
I'll tell you a little bit about Joe and then I'll tell you a little bit about how, um, how Joe and I became connected. So Joe is a minister, scholar, writer, and cultural organizer who works at the intersections of art, culture, spirituality, and social justice. He currently serves as Director of Community Engagement and Strategic Partnerships for Carpetbag Theater, which is an ensemble theater based in Knoxville, Tennessee, produces original works and whose mission it is to give artistic voice to people and communities that have traditionally been silenced. Additionally, Joe serves as the founder and lead cultural strategist for his own consultant business, Art at the Intersections, which is an arts and culture incubator that promotes cultural equity by working in partnership with artists and institutions to help them harness the power of art and culture through building, implementation, and evaluation of cultural strategies. Joe's work, um, so Joe holds a bachelor degree in communication from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and a Master's of Divinity with a concentration in social ethics from Union Theological Seminary in New York. His work has been supported by fellowships from the National Arts Strategies Creative Communities Fellowship and the Intercultural Leadership Institute. Joe believes that art and culture plays a vital role in any movement for social justice. And as a cultural organizer and consultant, Joe is a sought after facilitator and cultural strategist that works with communities, again, to help them harness the power of art and culture. He's also a writer, um, a storyteller, an, an artist himself, and, and so many other things. I had the great um, honor of meeting Joe. Gosh, Joe, I don't know how long it's been, maybe close to 10 years ago. Um, it, it feels like it. Time flies when we're having fun, right? Um, Joe, uh, I met Joe when the Carver brought Carpetbag Theater um, to San Antonio uh, for an artist residency. That was my first, my first interaction um, with Carpet Bag, but certainly not the Carver's first interaction. So the Carpet Bag Theater and the Carver Cultural Center have a long, long history. Um, we had a, a just transformational experience. Um, and one of the things that I cherish most out of that experience is an opportunity to meet and connect with and get to know Joe. Um, the work that he does is, as I said, transformational. And when Deborah talked to me about this event and the power of story, Joe was the first person that came to mind. Um, so I'm so glad that he agreed to be here with us this morning. I'm just happy to be here. And thank you all for the invitation. Thank you. Well, we're going to let you all get started right now. And... Uh... I think everyone can see you, and I'm going to make sure they can't see me anymore. So you guys take it away, thank you. So as Heather mentioned uh, when we first started that this is meant to be an interactive discussion and a lively conversation. So we're gonna go over really two things today. Um, one is what is a storyteller? And we've kind of covered that, but we'll go into a little bit more detail. And then the second part of that is understanding and kind of really starting to unpack the weight of our words. And so Joe and I had a very lively conversation earlier this week about that. And our goal is just to share some of our thoughts with you and we would hope that you would do the same. Um, one of the questions that I have for you guys, and I'd love for you to drop that in the chat boxes, you know, as we're talking about storytelling, I want you to think of a time that you heard a story or you read a story that really resonated with you right? Something that um, you remember. It may be a story that your grandma told you, a story that your parents told you, a story um, that you were told in your neighborhood, but give some thought to that. And let's talk a little bit about what a storyteller actually is. And so the first thing I want to tell you is that we all have a story, every single one of us. So if you're on this Zoom, you are a storyteller, you have a voice, you have your narrative, you have a tone. And so one of the biggest things I want to do is to really encourage you to share those stories, because through the preservation of stories, we're able to build authentic and dynamic relationships with each other. So um, 
you know, a storyteller is someone who may have an experience that they want to share. It's funny because about six months ago, I actually went to Booker T. Washington and I sat down with a bunch of fourth graders and I shared my story with them and they shared their stories with me. I grew up on the east side of San Antonio and um, I literally remember riding my bike on Hayes Street um, at my grandma's house. And so um, they asked me questions, but they also shared their stories of growing up on the East side and where they are now. And through that, we were actually able to connect, not as child adult, right? But as human to human. And I think that that's really important that we are encouraging and educating our, our young folks in San Antonio that they are holding stories every single day through their lens, through their experiences. Um, so that's that's a storyteller, someone who um, writes. And one of the things that I love to do is I love to journal. Um, and I've been working on journaling. And some people, you know, sometimes I'll share excerpts in my journal and sometimes I don't. Um, the other part is just understanding the weight of our words. You know, we're in a really interesting time right now in the world. We are um, in still very much in the middle of a pandemic where we've had to sit in spaces that actually force us to hold tension, right? And so what I've noticed, and Joe could probably chime in here, is I've, I'm going to be 100% real with you all. I've actually been very agitated by the way that we have seen words used. So I want you to weigh in on that, Joe, but I think one of the, the biggest things that hit me is two things. One is on Facebook, I actually would see memes of excerpts from Martin Luther King Jr. speech next to a meme that had uh, protesters who were protesting, but the words were rioters. And so um, what happened was people were comparing Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, words of being nonviolent to protesters who were being nonviolent, but labeling them as rioters. And so that really bothered me. And that's when I really started to see that the, the words that we use and the words that we share can be very dangerous. They could also be empowering. Um, and what, what happened is we took some empowering words and we twisted them for a narrative. Um, and so that was really interesting to me. Um, and that's something that I observed. And what it did was it really made, it, made me feel like I needed to take a little bit more accountability about the way that I actually use words. Um, Joe, how do you feel about that? Do you, did you, what words hit you? So, um, I was in undergrad um, during the time um, of Katrina, and um, I'll never forget, we were in like this media diversity class that was pretty much trying to animate critical thinking around the issues you just raised, and I will never forget um, that Associated Press um, caption um, to the image of black people wading through the water and trying to get supplies um, to survive the hardship that, that they were going through. And then next to that, there was another picture of, um, we'll say, European American um, doing the same thing. But the caption for them read, you know, something around um, trying to get food to survive. But when you looked at the photo um, from the same newswire service, um, it said that they were looters. And that always sticks with me because one thing that I believe is that there are histories and schools of thought connected to words. And when you put those two things together, it kind of laid bare the thinking and ethics and values of American society. And so, yeah, that's like the biggest example, how you can say someone is trying to do a thing to survive and then labeling one as looters. And then, you know, 
that comes with different actions um, from society for those two different things that people were just trying to survive and do what they could do in the moment of great disaster. Um, yeah, so that, that's one example that um, bubbles up for me all the time. That's really, that's really good. And I think that also um, the origin of words, the etymology of words continue to change. And so one of the things I remember growing up is that um, in my household, we had a dictionary and we had a thesaurus. And I can tell you that if we were to look into households, we would probably see less thesauruses and dictionaries because our dependence of Google, right? And our dependence of um, Wikipedia, we, we have become as, as a nation lazy um, when it comes to really finding out what a word was. I remember growing up when I would ask my mom about uh, the meaning of the word, she would point to the bookshelf and it was like, go look it up, right? And so what I've learned with my children is that when they're asking about something and they make a statement, I'll ask them, tell me a little bit about, about, that, about that word and what do you mean by that? So, um, for example, words that we really didn't use in the household, the kids thought that they were bad words until they went to a, to a friend's house and they heard the word, but the word was stupid. We do not use that word in, in our house. We don't use stupid. We don't use dumb, right? Because there is so much power in our words. If you look at Proverbs 18.21, it says the death and life Death and life are in the power of the tongue, right? And so you can speak death, but you can also speak life. And it really comes down to teaching our generations the power of the words that we use and also encouraging them to look up the definition of words. Because I have seen words be completely changed in the meanings. For example, and some of you may or may not disagree with me, Joe, you could let me know how you feel about this because we haven't talked about this, um, is the word woke, okay? So let's talk about this because if we look at the way the word woke has historically been used, it's been used by people of color, black folks, right? To kind of describe this um, alertness or this awakening, right? But it's interesting because you don't hear us really using that word as much because it's been adapted recently. When we're talking about the racial climate that we're in, we have a lot of people who are um, using that word to kind of say that they know a lot about black culture, people of color culture, and I would argue that that word now means something different. And um, we don't, we, I've noticed, I don't use it as much just because of that. Um, same thing with Black Lives Matter. I am all about the movement, but I can tell you, I do not like the way Black Lives Matter has become a political Marxist type of statement when in fact, I've encouraged friends who really do not understand Black Lives Matter to actually take the time to, to go and do the research to find out exactly where the words Black Lives Matter came from and what the original movement was. Um, Joe, how do you feel about that? Like, I, I don't know if you see that in your circles, but I see a lot of social media, hashtag Black Lives Matter, and then there's a sentence behind it that's like, that's not what Black Lives Matter is. <laughs> yeah, and um, I studied ethics in graduate school, so I'm also interested in how words, stories we tell lead to action. And my problem with woke, the word woke, when it's used by others, is that it leads to a performance of allyship that's very surface. Um, and yeah, and so I also see when things get adapted and transformed that it leads to action um, that aren't really <laughs> helpful, but it gives 
and you know, there's a lot of media and storytelling around social media and you know, all of that that's also at play. But I just wanted to um, shift us a bit to also um, think about the sense making and how that is a part of the power of our stories is that it helps us make sense of the world. And so, um, as you mentioned earlier, Dakri, like this time of the pandemic and also the political climate that we're in, it's very disheartening how certain um, narratives keep continuing to be pushed over and over again. And now, you know, I live in East Tennessee um, at the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountain. And, you know, I'm starting to see that these things that are being espoused from DC um, are actually starting to infiltrate and impact um, my daily life. So I can't tell you how many um, Blue Lives Matter flags, how many like Confederate flags that are now being flown in defiance of the calls to kind of reimagine the symbols of our country. Um, and so that is also a power, right? The power to kind of sow discord and to sow um, separation and division. But I was introduced to this concept that I would like to share um, from this a theologian that I'm doing some work with um, in their book, Activist Theology. In the book, um, Dr. Robin talks about this concept of restoring ourselves. And that to me is the antithesis of the power of a story to sow discord and division. And so um, one of the things that I think storytelling does very well when we're able to sit with each other like this and you know bring diverse groups together is that it gives us that opportunity opportunity to restore ourselves and what um robin meant by that was the ability to see differently the ability to have what you thought as truth to expand and i think that that's kind of why i love organizations like this one is because when, especially when you're talking about archiving and preserving the stories, it allows people the chance to step into a life, into a way of thinking and being that is totally different from them and allows us the opportunity to restore ourselves and begin to see how systems and structures are keeping us apart, to see how we are more alike than we thought. And so um, I do think that that is also when I think about the power of story, this power to restory and to reframe is the word that we use a lot at Carpet Bag. The stories that we tell ourselves, because the stories we tell ourselves animate us and move us to action in ways that embody our story. And so what stories are we telling? How can we use the power of story to restory even the narrative that we've attached to this country, um, quite frankly, um, because I believe that that will get us more to a liberated future where everybody can thrive when we begin to see stories outside of ourselves as similar and um, thought provoking and mind shifting. And so I just wanted to throw that in there um, because in this moment, it's so easy to despair and think that the only stories that are rising to the top are the ones that are showing discord, but the power of a story is the ability to help each other reframe what we know or thought to be true. So I just wanted to throw that out there. So, good. so um, we got a question from Velma and she basically says, and thank you, Velma, everybody feel free to ask questions, but Velma has a great question here. She said, Language has always been something that evolves and changes. In this era of superficiality and being in the moment, how can we maintain the meanings of words that are important to us? What do you think, Joe? You wanna take that? We could talk a little bit about it. Yeah, um, I just would say sharing with each other, like actually keeping the words alive um 
because it's phrases that my grandmother used with me <laughs> before she passed that until she said them, I didn't know, like, I didn't know the words, I didn't know what was meant by them. But now um, I find myself using some of them, you mm -hmm. know, and with the knowledge of what my grandmother meant by them. And so I think one of the ways just to keep our vernacular alive is just to keep it in use and to use them with different generations who may be younger. Um, and also just to see um, to see it as valuable, because I feel like so much of Black vernacular and phrasing and all of that is just seen in such disdain. And I'm not only talking about slang, but I just feel like there's a general way that Black language and the way that Black people have historically used it and adapted it and shaped it is almost always at first seen with disdain until it's co-opted. Um, right. And so I think that we just need to keep it in circulation. Um, there's a phrase that my grandmother <laughs> used to use, um, fairly middling, and I like had no clue <laughs> what that meant. Um, until she used it with me and you know like eh, so so is the way she would use it and you know that just cracks me up and it's also good because those are things that help me keep her present in my life and very much with me is the words and the stories and so that's another power now that I think about it is to keep the people who are no longer with us with us by the things that they said and imparted to us during their lifetime. So use the words is my Definitely, answer. and write them down, you know? I mean, write them down, have them around. It's so funny, if I could walk around um, and take my computer screen, what you would see is I actually created just a bunch of note cards that I have in my kitchen, on my refrigerator, things to empower and encourage me. And a lot of them come from things that my grandma used to tell me. Like one would be like, um, uh, she would say something like, get smart, you know? So that, you know, and she would say, you know, there's nothing like common sense, you know, just, just, and I would always be like, common sense? what does she mean especially as a little girl and then as I started to grow old to grow up I thought oh that's what she means and you know what I love about what she used to say is she taught me the importance that academics are important right I mean I was the first one to graduate from college which is a big deal for us in communities of color right to to grab to get your education right and it's something that we we strive for but she would always tell me you know common sense you can have more common sense than book sense and make it in this world and so by her telling me that it gave me this this totality and that's the one thing about stories especially um as joe mentioned in our climate that it's so important that we understand the totality of the stories that we tell and that we're able to, to put them into context, right? Because if you take a story and you take it out of context, then what you have is you have, you have um, skewed perspectives and you've skewed the way that people think about things. And, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, George Floyd here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the fact that people labeled it a death, in fact, it was murder, <laughs> okay? So you're reading in the headlines the death of George Floyd as if it was his fault, right? When in fact, it was the murder of George Floyd. And so do we see how even the way that we use words can definitely matter because it, we have not, where I say the murder, just like where we say police brutality, that was police, that, that was murder by the police, okay? Because police brutality in my mind is beating someone. Murder is killing someone. And so when we use words interchangeably to fit a narrative, it becomes very dangerous. So I want you guys to think about that. Think about a time in which you read a story and you're like, what? 
right? And I mean, and if, if here's a fun exercise, and it for me it's fun, but it's also somewhat painful. If you go back and Google news stories from four or five years ago, and you just look at the headlines, you look at the way that they're reported, it's very easy to see how there is this legacy of misinformation, miseducation, and manipulation of the way things are reported. And so to be a good ancestor is to sit down and look at those with your children and say, this is not accurate. Because what happens is 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now, as we archive these things and we read these stories, we know that from what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma with the riots, the story was not told correctly, accurately at all. And people were outraged now that they're finding out about this that they did not know, right? And so um, I can tell you in terms of history, it was really difficult for me to learn about the Alamo and to get the real representation of what actually happened with black folks in San Antonio as it relates to the history of the Alamo, something I did not learn in the fifth and sixth grade. And so we cannot, we cannot be okay with this in the sense that we all have to do our jobs to take our personal accountability with not only the way that we use our words and the stories that we tell, but the stories that are told to us, right? And so I just think that, I mean, I, I see Joe shaking his head. I think it's so important because I have an 11 year old, uh, 18 year old and 21 year old. And I remember sitting down and going through old news clips, right? With things that were alluded to in Texas history books and really teaching my child the whole story and her asking me, why aren't we, I ha why am I not learning about this? And so to be a good ancestor now is to do that. To be a good ancestor now, you don't have to wait until you are away from this earth to be a good ancestor. And we should all be taking a proactive role in becoming great ancestors through the stories that we tell and through the stories that we restory and reframe. Joe, what do you have to add to that? I just wanted to bring up Antoinette's comment in the chat. Um, Antoinette was saying that the youth that she mentors um, always tell them to keep a pen and a notebook handy. Mm -hmm. And um, as you can see, like I have a lot of books and things. Um, and I think that's important um, because we have to leave the legacy of ourselves. Because um, I think the thing about history and what is included in the textbook, like literally, Still, I hear that there's only a paragraph about slavery, a paragraph about Martin Luther King, and then that's it. And then it's just like Black people went into like oblivion or wherever. And you know, it's important. You know, I am a sporadic journaler, so when I really have something to say, I write it down, but I'm trying to get in the habit of doing like daily recaps. Mm -hmm. Just to say what my day was like, because I think we overlook um, the everyday as being less important than those big highlighting achievement moments. Right, yeah. And, you know, I think that that's just as important as, you know, winning the Nobel Peace Prize or some other kind of big accolade. Um, and I have this book on my desk, and I think it proves that point. So. In the Life was written by, um, was edited by rather, Joseph Bean. And Joseph Bean was a black gay man um, that was living during the AIDS crisis. And this book is still heavily referenced and all he wanted to do was chronicle the life of black gay men that up until that point wasn't considered, wasn't talked about, and you know, thank God for black women because he used the black feminists of the time to get the idea because they preserved their stories, they preserved their literature, their essays, but he was like, no one is doing this for us. And he was 
collected um, writings um, of Black gay men and so many people who I talked to still reference this book as something that's a touch point for them in the journey of their becoming. And so we have to leave the roadmap because our everyday living provides the roadmap for people who come after. Um, and um, Antoinette also, I think it was, put that we should start clipping newspaper articles and writing our version of events um, alongside them. And that is such a brilliant idea. So I just wanted to lift that up as um, a possible way to do a different kind of archival work. It's so good. And then I think that um, there are two thoughts. One I saw um, was, how do we feel about the word consciousness? I really do. I do like that word. I think that to Joe's point of not having to wait until, you know, a year from now to write, but actually capturing writings daily is a great practice. And I believe that that keeps us present in the moment. Um, one of the positive parts of, for me personally, with what's happened in this pandemic is the fact that I have to sit down and really think about some of these words. I can tell you that before this time last year, the word minority did not bother me. But as I've started to learn more about that word and also to research the design of that word in terms of systematic and systemic racism, that word bothers me because what it does is it tells people of color that we're a smaller group. When in reality, if you were to open up your global perspective and look at the millions of people that are of color and all nationalities on this earth going back to when man first was here, then the word minority does not make sense to you. Then you start to question the origin of this word, where it came from and how it's used and in what context it's used for. And so I had not arrived to that. I, I really hadn't sat with that word to think about it. And so my challenge to you is that if a word bothers you, even in conversation, and you're not quite sure as to why, instead of, instead of letting it go, right, or just being like, that's odd, I encourage you to sit with that word, write it down, go back and look at the etymology, go to the thesaurus, look at the origin of the word and ask, start to ask yourself some questions like, what, how does this word used in a sentence, right? And then you start to see, wow, it's interesting how this word was taken out of context and created to fit into a system, to be told in a narrative that fits an agenda. And so um, I'm, I'm hoping that, that that helps a little bit because that really helped me in terms of being able to sit with certain words. Just for example, when we described ourselves as the descendants of slaves. Well, up until I started to re do research and actually listen to the 1619 podcast from Nicole Hannah Jones, right? I was like, wow, man, we were not slaves. We were, we were, I'm a descendant of Africans who were enslaved, captured, tortured, beaten. Totally different than just starting off. And we're in history, we're told that we came here as slaves, right? And, and so it's a deficit in which we're introduced to ourselves. And so when we're talking about words and stories, there's two types that really stand out. There's asset framing, which is basically stories that are told through agency, through, through resource, right? Through the lens of totality, right? And then there's deficit framing, and that's the lack of. That's the story that's told from a beginning lack of perspective. And so asset framing and deficit framing, you will see in stories. All you really have to do is look and become intentional. And so um, that is one of the things that I've been doing. I don't read anything and just take it at, as face value. I wanna learn the totality, totality of the story. And the answer in all of that is that it's complex. There is no one size fits all narrative. There is no one size fits all approach. Black folks in particular are not a monolith. 
we may not all agree. We come from different backgrounds, different perspectives, different learned experiences. And that's why it's important for us to share our stories with each other, because as Joe said, we're more connected and we're more alike than we actually think we are. And through sharing stories from an authentic place and learning from each other, that's when the richness right and and the the amazing goodness comes out of our ability to connect so um i see another question maybe uh joe you could take this how do various media platforms contribute to the asset deficit narrative so i'm just gonna be honest um during grad school i got rid of my tv you got uh, rid of what my television um, and part of the reasoning behind it is that literally, I think it's like five or, or six people, and you um, can correct me if I get the number wrong, Zachary, but it's like five or six people own all of the media. Um, in a, and so I feel like now that media has been monetized, Mm -hmm. and engrafted into the capitalist machine, it's hard for me to trust any of it, quite <laughs> frankly, um, because it's less about the quality of information, it's less about the quality of the journalism and doing the due diligence that um, I was taught to do um, as a student in the School of Communications, and it's more about what can sell a book. So, uh, sell advertising dollars. So honestly, I think that that's a big thing that adds to the deficit narrative. And then again, there was during my time in undergrad, the hopeful moment of the democracy of social media. And, you know, it started out as a good thing, but now like you're competing with algorithms and what rises to the surface. And so in many ways, it's just like confirming already held beliefs. And so again, that's why I think organizations like this one and others who are doing community story work in many different ways is important because it's kind of cutting through how the systems have co-opted um, the media landscape. Um, yeah, I see that. I see it. Oh, I was going to say I do agree. Because um, yeah. if you haven't seen Watchmen, mm -hmm. the limited series on HBO, it was amazing because right out the gate, it started with a Tulsa massacre. And right. that put it like right front and center of the storyline. Yes. Um, and so I do believe that we are seeing a diversity of voices on that side. But I just wish that that can come back into journalism because that's how a lot of people get and interpret information and may not do the deeper dive into a TV show because then it's just presented as entertainment. Exactly. And so I, and so I think that there's, if people are willing to do that work, to see the messages and the ideology, ideology that's in all art production, then that's amazing. But I think most people just write it off as entertainment and don't do the deeper digging um, of getting to where the stories come from, what inspired the stories. And so right. I just think that's why I put my emphasis and my answer on news um, because people take it as fact when one they will argue. They to do the research. That's right. the thing. And I think that it's also coming down to discernment and, and questioning, as Joel said, further, I guess, a further um, research dive, you know, um, because you can read a news story and accept it as fact, or you can actually go and do some research about specific incidents in that news story that make you ponder, right? There's a level of pontification where you're like, mm, I'm, so I'm going to go and do some research, and then you can do that. And so, um, you can talk to someone who may have been in Tulsa during that time and have someone's recount of that. And that's the other thing when we're talking about oral histories and stories is that there are people who are still living and remember 
what happened in Tulsa. And at the time, it wasn't safe to talk about it. It wasn't safe to write about it. And so people did not because they had families to feed. And that's real. And so, but now one of the best ways to actually learn is to talk to someone who is an ancestor, to talk to someone who has lived that experience and to talk to people who lived that experience to hear their perspectives about those stories. I think that's really, really important. And I think that that's something that I've sat down with my dad and I'm like, tell me about how San Antonio was when you were a little boy. And my dad told me this story that I had never heard. I had to ask him because think about this, when you have grandparents and um, who lived through those times, that's a very painful thing for them to talk about. And as black folks and people of color, we have been conditioned as a matter of survival to keep it moving and not to uncover and talk about things. And we're learning from a mental health perspective. That's why we have a lot of mental health issues in our communities because we haven't openly discussed issues that we struggle with. And so I just asked my dad flat out, made him dinner. I said, tell me a little bit about what San Antonio looked like when you were a kid. And he told me a story of when he was seven years old and he wanted to go into a restaurant and he asked for water and he remembers that the waitress, he had to go in on the backside, like towards the back of the restaurant. His, my grandmother asked the waitress who was white for a glass of water for him, a seven year old boy, right? And he remembers her taking a glass out of the dirty dish bin, filling it up with water and sitting on the counter for him to drink. And he remembers his mother, my grandmother saying, no, thank you, we'll go somewhere else for a glass of water. I learned about my grandfather, Willie H. Brooks, born 1906. And my dad told me stories about him. And so I would encourage you that if you are around with relatives, they may not volunteer the information, but here's where you can ask for them to share something that stood out to them, right? So that I can see San Antonio as the complex city that it is. And so I think it's really important for us to take that accountability through asking those stories. And because I heard this story from my dad, I'm now able to pass that on and share that story with my kids. So that when my kids are my age, they can talk about how they heard the story of their great grandfather or their great grandmother and what the city looked like at that time. So I hope that that was helpful. I mean, I, I, I think that one of the things that we do is we, we just really have to have some conversations you know, through our stories. And I want to say that in terms of media platforms, one of the media platforms that I have really started to really tr lean into is Instagram, which seems so weird, but there are so many amazing activists who share stories for free on Instagram. They come in and they'll do a, you know, they'll do a story or they'll have a series. Sonia Renee Taylor is amazing. Layla Saad is amazing. Rachel Cargill is incredible. I mean, we have these fierce women, right? And men who are sharing information on Instagram that will lead you to say, wow, that's interesting. I wanna go and learn more. And then you do your homework and you go and learn more. Podcasts, the same thing. You know, um, I listen to podcasts all the time. I love the Good Ancestor podcast by Layla Saad. I think it's incredible. Um, but there, there are tons of really great podcasts. Um, the 1619 Project has a whole podcast series. And uh, the story of June, a Black farmer who literally had had this farm passed on to him throughout generations, couldn't get bank loans fast enough and ended up actually losing the farmland that was passed down to him by his father, that story stuck to me. So I would encourage you guys to, to lean in and to ask questions, to be innately curious, right? And, and to be inquisitive and also to, to take time to look at the stories that are right in front of your face because there's so many of them. Um, 
Wow, that's good, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'm being the I'm being the voice because it's eleven. And um we we want to make sure that we honor everyone's time. So uh let me start my video here, maybe. Okay, here we go. So I just have a couple things that I want to to say, and then I'm going to let our uh, STEAM speakers have the final say. But before everyone goes, I want to thank again the part the, our partner, the Carver Community Cultural Center, and uh, scheduled for 20 this season that was postponed was a storytelling um, piece called 11 Reflections of September. So look for that to um, come back to the Carver. We want to share the virtual exhibit that debuted today, The Power of Your Story. Um, talks about how you can interview your family, questions to ask, how you can make a grandparents book. There's a number of activities. There are also stories. We have a story where you can hear ex-slaves tell their story of what they remember. So you can see how powerful storytelling is. We also have a three minute wrenching clip on when Gwen Moulton, the last time she spoke to Denise McNair, which was the day before she was murdered in the bombing in Birmingham. She was one of the four young ladies that were murdered at church. So there are a number of stories. And then we have stories from our own San Antonio heroes on that exhibit. The cool thing about our exhibits is that they are very mobile friendly. So you do not have to be in front of a laptop to look at our exhibits, sacam.org. Also, we have a storytelling portal where you can upload uh, your stories and also scan items. We are beefing that up. We're so happy. You should see a new um, version of that coming in about three weeks where it will be much more interactive. Each story will have a page. There will be an interactive map. So we're really excited about that. So in this season of COVID, when you are forced, as Dakri said, to think about words and to think about stories, we encourage you to take advantage of the uh, resources that we have at sacam.org. And we also have on the story portion, uh, it's called Share Your Story, we have a workshop that, a, a virtual workshop on how to journal creatively, Joe, so that might be helpful for you. Um, thank the friends of SACAM. You guys are dears and our volunteers who got on the phone and made phone calls to remind people, thank you so much. I wanna thank the board and thanks to our uh, staff. Last but not least, the people who decided to spend Saturday morning with us, thank you. So uh, Joe, because I know you've got to get to choir rehearsal, why don't you start with your uh, closing remarks and then Dakri, thank you guys so much. This was so amazing and we look forward to having more storytelling discussion before the end of the year. Thank you. Yeah, I am just grateful for the time and the community building that happened, because um, I think there is a way that we think that we can't build community online, and this is proof of that. Um, I am just grateful, um, and I just would implore you to support your community-based institutions um, like SACAM, like Carver, um, because if you don't support them, um, we don't exist. And, you know, this was my first interaction with SACAM, but I have thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, this is something that I'm passionate about. And so it's great to see that um, there are people who are doing this work in many different ways through theater, oral histories. Um, and I'm just grateful. Those are my closing words, filled with gratitude. Same, I mean, I can't um, 
I can't really back Joe's comments enough. I am so thankful to say Cam and I'm really just in awe of the work that's being done. And I think at, at a time in life as we are in the, in the place we are right now, this is so critically important. And I've had to rethink and challenge myself as to the way that I see the world and the stories that I've told. And so I just want to encourage every single person on here, as I said in the beginning, you are storytellers. Um, you have voices and narratives that, that have yet to be told, you know. Um, Maya Angelou, we talked about her in my intro, but I definitely, she's someone that has inspired me beyond belief because one of the biggest, one of her quotes, and I'm probably going to paraphrase, paraphrase it, um, is she said, like, one of the biggest tragedies is those, you know, unbearing of a story that's yet to be told. And so my question as we leave is, what's the story inside of you that needs to be told? And I encourage you to step out on courage and to share that, share that with your children, share that with a relative and encourage them to hold it, right? Because we are all ancestors and it's our responsibility to leave an indelible mark on future generations. And we need to preserve the beauty and the agency and just the richness that each and every single one of us hold as humans on this earth. It's so important. And so thank you again, say Cam, Joe, it's been incredible conversating with you. I could do this all day long on a Saturday, but um, I'm just very thankful and grateful for every single face, person, name on this Zoom. So thank you, say Cam. Thank you, everyone. I had to make sure I wasn't muted. You um, will have a survey. We appreciate you spending your Saturday morning with us. Have a blessed day. Bye, guys.